I'm here to talk about Rust, uh, Open API, servers and clients. And this is really an experience report of a journey that we've been on for the last four years, doing some stuff that uh, I haven't seen a lot of folks doing. So hopefully you can derive something from our experiences, both positive and negative. So first, I want to talk about what is Oxide. So we're a company. We've been around four years. We're building this rack scale computer in the style of like the hyperscalers. Uh, it's on premises. It's like a private cloud in a box. It's got all the software included. And, and just as an aside, this is the premise. Okay, those are the premises. Like where the box is is on premises. So if you say it's on premise, like you're just saying something different, you're just trolling people like me who are really picky in. So just, just know that. Um, or alternatively, as the Hacker News folks would have it, uh, we're a mainframe for Zoomers with TypeScript, JSON, Kubernetes, and all this garbage that makes your mainframe. Um, have people heard of Oxide before? Anyone in the audience familiar with this thing? Okay, so for the small number of hands, I also have been loaded up with like t-shirts. I've become like a swag mule, so please stop me so I don't have to bring it home. Uh, I, I brought way too many t-shirts. Um, so uh, I mentioned that we're building like this hardware product, so where does like the software get involved? Well, the hardware is very, very cool, and we talk about it a lot. You can like look us up, we, we chat about it on our podcast, on our website, and pretty much anywhere. But there's a lot of software that drives this thing, so how do we turn these hardware components into this API-driven private cloud platform that, again, runs on-premises. Um, so they're like data services like virtual storage or networking services like a virtual private cloud. Um, there's a control plane for doing all the configuration of and control of this stuff. And it's all divided up into these different services. I hesitate to say microservices. It's not macroservices. It's sort of like Goldilocks services. We just pick things of the right size. We're not too prescriptive about the size or scope or scale of the services, but it's different services communicating as you might expect. So now back to the again, premise of this talk, why open API? Well, at Oxide, we do lots and lots of stuff that's very weird, like lots of stuff that's weird. We build our own hardware, we build our own motherboards, we're building our own dongles that I'll show a little bit later. Um, but for open API, we just for once in our lives said, hey, it seems to be popular, let's use it, let's not reinvent the wheel. Uh, and we use it to describe our internal services. We use it to describe our external API that our, our end customers use to interact with the product. And as I say, one of the rare opportunities that we've seen is to be normal. And we thought it had this vibrant ecosystem of open source uh, tooling that we could use for, to derive lots of cool stuff. Little foreshadowing there. So now, uh, why Rust? So, Back in 2020, when we really started building this thing, we knew there was lots of different components that were gonna go into it. Um, we we're gonna have an embedded operating system low down in the system to do low level controls of the CPU, of power, power regulators, all that kind of stuff. We knew there's gonna be a host operating system, virtualization layer, storage software, uh, lots of stuff all over the place. Now for low level software in 2020, I think Rust was becoming a pretty consensus answer. Like, like low-level systems folks were, by and large, moving towards Rust. And if anything, that has become more and more true. Like, if you are writing like a new hypervisor or something low-level, writing something embedded, uh, it's not just the hipsters anymore. It has become more, more mainstream. It was not clear, at least to me, that Rust was the appropriate language to use for higher-level software. Uh, I remember coming in, maybe in my first week, and saying, like, why aren't we using something like Java? Like, Java has... Uh, memory safety, why aren't we using that for our API layer and for some of these higher level services? And of course, memory safety we get out of the box with Rust, and, that, and that's important everywhere. But so is like the memory footprint, and so is the autonomous nature of these things. And I had been working, uh, a bunch of my early colleagues at Oxide had worked with systems like Java systems where it kind of required constant care and feeding. Like how do we tune the JVM, and JVM's using too much memory, and we have to restart the JVM, and stuff like that. So I think we're all very sensitive to the last problem that, that injured us. Uh, we've been injured by a lot of problems at Oxide, so we have a lot of weird sensitivities. So, um, you know, I thought, you know, why not use something like Drop Wizard and just be normal? But the consensus was, hey, we named the company Oxide, so we're going to embrace Rust for everything. So that's why Rust, among other reasons. Um, so out of the shoot, we weren't going to use something like Drop Wizard. We were going to need some kind of HTTP framework. My colleague, Dave Pacheco, did a great survey of all the stuff that we saw in the Rust ecosystem. 
and decided that none of them is really well suited for what we needed. So the start of our kind of API, open API journey really started with defining our own HTTP framework that we called Dropshot, which is sort of like a play on Drop Wizard and also like a weird ping pong variant that we like to play. Um, so at its core, Dropshot was intended to like emit open API documents. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is a little bit heretical. So if you hang out with any like real open API nerds, uh, just like omit this part because you know, I think the, the folks that, you know, I, I had come into Oxide having done a bunch of stuff with OpenAPI, worked with uh, the OpenAPI group a bit, great folks. But they really have the opinion that you start with the spec and then people work against the spec. And we, we're, we were moving this code around so quick, we didn't know what the shape of this thing was gonna look like. We didn't know a priori how to define this. So we really wanted the code to be the truth and for the spec to be derived from it. As I say, like, heretical among a certain group of API, open API advocates, but it really made sense for the, the phase of evolution that we were in at the time. So you define your open API, you define, pardon me, your API based on code, and then out comes the open API document. Um, so we built Dropshot into all these different services, you know, low level services, storage, uh, virtual, uh, virtual private cloud, uh, all of these different places. Oh, by the way, um, if you wanna see a talk on Dropshot, I gave one a few years ago, and there's a, a link at the end of the talk. Uh, oh, pardon me. So now we wanted to start consuming these APIs. We had all these APIs. Like, now we wanted to have all these services start to talk to each other. So this is where we started to have some open API ecosystem fail um, and, and maybe some disappointment. A again, we thought API, open API was going to be great because uh, of this thriving ecosystem, or if we needed a thing, we'd be able to take it off the shelf and just apply it but we, we were pretty disappointed. So the first example was with Rust client bindings. We have Rust code, talking to other Rust code, uh, informed by this open API document. So we searched around, and there's this great thing, open API generator. The open API generator gave me this eye chart of all the things it supports, like from Ada and Apex and Julia and K6 and Kotlin, whatever, uh, all this stuff. And, and if you squint, and I made it easy, you can even find Rust there. Great, Rust is supported, let's do it. And it just didn't work at all. Like just didn't even get off the floor. Like we couldn't, couldn't make it work. Like couldn't, the output would not compile. And this was, you know, it, and we found this to be the case with, you know, other pieces of software. Like software isn't perfect, especially open source software. We don't have expectations that it can be perfect. So, you know, we spent a lot of time at Oxide in investing and in, in integrating, participating in these different open source communities. So a couple of my colleagues and I really tried, really, really earnestly tried to make an open API generator work, not like in the way we wanted, just like at all, and we could not get it off the floor. So like we did with so many things at Oxide, we built our own. So we built this thing called Progenitor. So it outputs uh, client bindings, but really specifically for the shape of OpenAPI document that we were getting out of our drop shot based services. So initially this wasn't intended to be a thing that could consume any type of OpenAPI in the world. Um, have folks like monkeyed around with OpenAPI at all? A couple of, yeah, almost everybody. Um, it is diverse, like you can, there are eight different ways of saying the same thing. Um, and so it is it's very flexible. Uh, we were trying to be very inflexible, like we were trying to do it one particular way. So uh, with Progenitor, we wanted this to be fully automated, like no user intervention required, and just to immediately pick up any changes to the specification documents and turn that uh, into a client binding. So I'm gonna show you a very unspectacular view of what it looks like, which is this. Now, is anyone here familiar with Rust? I should have asked earlier. One, two, three. Uh, people rec like, have any shout out what, what this construction might be? Uh, it's, a macro. it's a macro, right, it's a macro. And so if you see an exclamation point at Rust, what it really means is pay attention because literally anything could happen here. Uh, so. Now, I, I know that like the easiest way to tell if someone's a Rust programmer is because they tell you they are, and I'm about to tell you how I am. So uh, when, I was, when I was learning Rust, I was reading this book on Rust, and it had this chapter on macros. And I was just like wrapped, like turning page after page, could not get enough. I feel like I'm like introducing a, 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 a group to like my, my drug habit or something. Um, so uh, Rust macros, I, I, you know, I came from C and, and from, from Java in my past experience, 
But Rust macros are so beautiful. You take, like, you are just writing Rust code to emit other Rust tokens, and the compiler just treats that as a plugin and dumps it into the AST for, like, the code being compiled. It is truly beautiful. And there's this great ecosystem in Rust for parsing tokens into abstract syntax trees, for, for uh, emitting tokens in this kind of quoted format, for producing error messages where it, like, really underlines the thing that specifically you screwed up. It is beautiful. So the reason we used it here is that macros let us just pick up that file off of disk and recompile, really turn it like a compiler from OpenAPI into these, these client bindings. So all of that complexity is just like hidden behind the macro. Until sometimes it is, and, and, and feel free to stop me in the hallway if, uh, if you want to know the details of that. But by and large, uh, hidden behind that macro. So. Um, with Progenitor, we're emitting what I'm gonna call idiomatic SDKs. Now, how do I know that they're idiomatic? Because I work with a bunch of loud people who use a lot of Rust, and they have basically not complained. So that, that, those are my indications that we've done a pretty good job uh, emitting some, some idiomatic SDKs. Um, you know, automatic client generation eliminates this huge class of error. Like even for the brief period that we didn't have Progenitor, you know, client and server would be out of sync, where like if you made some change of a type definition within a server, and you forgot to update the client, all of a sudden it would be miscommunicating. Now, sometimes it'd be miscommunicating in ways where like the worst possible thing, which was it worked some of the time, right? Like you forgot one field and like mostly it was a fine, but when you tried a different kind of configuration of things, it didn't work properly. Um, this reminds me of like when my first job was at Sun Microsystems working in the Solaris kernel group, and every change terrified me. Like every change I would, I would merge and then wake up at six o'clock the next morning to see if the build had completed properly. So uh, as opposed to like our more modern era where you expect by the time CI passes or even if I like just run my test locally, everything's gonna work, and that's what that gave us here. This ability to do really fearless changes to the API, fearless changes to different services, and then fearless refactors, which is like huge when you're trying to go quickly. Um, another kind of bugaboo of mine is pagination. One of the things I've seen in OpenAPI and API, in different APIs is that everyone wanted to do pagination a specifically different way. Um, I, I spent a bunch of time in the Slack API for weird reasons, and there were like five or six distinct ways of paginating through entries there. And one of our goals with Dropshot and, uh, was to make it easy to do things the right way and hard to do things the wrong way. We knew that with this diverse group of folks kind of all marching as quickly as possible, if we said go build your API service, we're gonna have like, for six groups, we're gonna have seven different ways of paginating. So what we did with Dropshot is made it really easy to do pagination one way, and the upshot of that was when we get to uh, generating the SDK, and, uh, and this is true for progenitor in the Rust SDK, but also true in TypeScript and Go and other SDKs that we generate, we can do this much more, like an idiomatic um, iteration through the items in the paginated collection where we don't necessarily need to expose or the user doesn't need to know, okay, there are 12 in this page and 15 in the next page and so forth. So um, even if you're not that familiar with Rust, I think you could probably imagine that a stream is like a stream of items. Um, if in this case I'm looking for the list of instances, like the list of VMs on my Oxide rack in a particular project, and I'm just able to iterate through those. So allowed for really nice kind of end-to-end simplicity. We also ran into some kind of interesting surprises, some, some mostly beneficial surprises along the way. So uh, we started using uh, Progenitor with the idea of using it for our internal APIs. Turned out that like investing for internal APIs and with the same tooling for, as our external APIs kind of had a lot of the same constraints. Like we want the docs to be great in both, like whether it's for our end users or for our internal users. Um, for our public SDK, uh, the progenitor all in is about 20,000 lines of code and it emits just for our public SDK about 60,000 lines of code. Um, so already it was like a huge win. And like those are 60,000 lines of the most boring code in the universe that you do not want to have to write much less have to like curate and maintain every time the API changes. So that was a huge win. Some other bigger surprises were later on we wanted a CLI. So like, I mean, of course, right? Like we wanted a CLI so that users could interact with this thing, not just through like a graphical console, 
but through, like, through the command line. Using Progenitor, we are able to use that same abstract, abstract, pardon me, abstract syntax tree that we're using for SDK generation to then also generate a CLI. And then to test that, we were able to generate a mocking library. So all of those things kind of filtered into, uh, again, a lot of surprising use cases. So what do we learn from this whole experience? First, you'll have to forgive me. Like, I, I said I was a Rust programmer. I'm going to say it again. Like, it was great. And look, I get it. Like, we're a meme. Like, we tell you to use Rust. Um, but if you haven't tried it out, like, Rust is kind of very rectilinear and very, like, fussy. And I feel like for all of us who are like, API Summit, heck yeah. Like, we are rectilinear and fussy. I think there's like a certain demographic that is attracted. And I think that there, you will find something in Rust uh, that, that appeals to that rectilinearness and fussiness. Um, there's like a high learning curve. But I think that if you invest a little bit of time, it pays you back. Um, the next lesson was write the tools that we need. I was very reluctant to start writing Progenitor. I think in general. People can be kind of reluctant to start writing tooling, especially tooling of the forum, where like, I'm going to go do a thing, and then everyone is going to need to operate in the function that I describe. And also, the thing that I have, like, it's vaporware. Um, also, if I had really understood OpenAPI and JSON schema like I do now, I'm not sure I would have started at all, because those are monstrously complex specs, very hard to cover all the surfaces of. But a good reminder, if you're considering this kind of tooling, is like, you don't need to solve the general problem. You need to solve your problem. And in some cases, we found that the APIs that we were generating, or pardon me, the, like the actual uh, servers that we were generating, the open API documents that we were generating, were producing very complex outputs. And so rather sometimes than, than adapting the generator to accept those, accept that new open API document, we changed the API. Now, that's a little bit of like the tail wagging the dog. Like, why are you letting the SDK generator tell you how to construct the API? In almost every case, though, it led to a simpler API. So I just mean, like, you can be unafraid to say, why don't we just do things simpler? Why don't we make our holistic life simpler rather than uh, trying to suffer through like the, these arbitrary complexities? Um, I highlight this kind of tooling. Uh, so this is a, I, I mentioned that we build a lot of hardware. I feel like this is rep representative of some of the tooling we built. This is a U.2 connector. So like a, 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 um, like a SSD connector that like weasels its way out the front of the box so that we can plug in a NIC. It's like, and if you can read it, it says computer this direction, jank that direction. Um, so th this is the kind of tooling that we would build internally uh, to satisfy our own needs. Again, not worried about the general case, not worried about the general public, but to solve the problems that we have. Um, my colleague, Brian Cantrell, gave a great talk called uh, The Primacy of Toolmaking link at the end, uh, with a little bit of a warning. The first, like, 15 slides are about sharpening an ax and about the etymology of, like, the quote. And I can only tell you that it, it before we edited it down from, like, 25 slides about ax sharpening. So, but it's still a lot. It's a lot of ax, but gets to some good stuff about tooling. Um, and then the last lesson I say is, is owning your strategic weirdness. So open API was right. Like, we made the right choice there. Like, everyone seems to be using it for good and ill, even though the ecosystem wasn't what we had hoped it would be. But I would say that um, we knew that we were doing something a little bit different. We knew that, there, that the way that we wanted to use OpenAPI as output, the way that we wanted to construct the rest of the world around it and have our services talk together was a little different. So it turned out that even if we had gotten an OpenAPI generator working in just the way that we had hoped for, I think owning Progenitor and op owning the, that, that generation tooling turned out to be incredibly important for lots of other stuff that we're doing. So as you're considering tooling that you might take on or your organization might take on, knowing, like, you know, if this is some weirdness that we really want to embrace and we think might be an area to invest, it's a great way. Like, you know, owning that tooling rather than adapting some other project is a great way to take that on. Um, so... That's my talk. Thanks very much for attending, and I uh, hope you took something away.